And I think one of the things that Lisa mentioned when she opened was, you know, we haven't talked about this seriously and rigorously in, in the courts, uh, you know, for 69 years. And so I want to ask an absolutely <clears throat> pragmatic question uh, of the panel, and that is, why now? Why, after all this silence, does the Supreme Court agree to hear this case, and what is the scope of, of what they're going to do? John, do you want to? Well, I'll take a crack at it. I, I think that, um, <coughs> I believe this is right. I haven't gone back and looked, but um, uh, I think that the opportunities for the court to, in fact, take such a case have been extremely limited. So it's not like on their docket every year there are cases raising Second Amendment issues. That's just not true. Um, and this is a case that um, got a lot of notoriety when it was decided um, in the D.C. Circuit. And um, so that's number one, that they don't have a lot of opportunities. Number two, I think we have seen uh, an evolving debate uh, and a use of those words in the Second Amendment for whether they are for purposes that are uh, ahistorical, uh, we can have an argument about it, but there's certainly now a large group of uh, folks who want to say that uh, the right of the people to keep and bear arms on its own with no need for context um, constitutes an individual right that can be asserted against. Uh, and that's a growing body of folks out there. I don't want to belittle it. I think it's wrong, but there's clearly a growing body out there uh, that has now resulted in a uh, successful challenge to a, a gun control uh, uh, provision in a you know, very uh, high uh, visibility jurisdiction, the District of Columbia. Uh, so I think that's why. There haven't been a lot of occasions. Uh, uh, some of the dialogue on this issue has changed quite dramatically and this may be the first real opportunity for this to actually uh, result in a case that the court could take, and they took it. Um, 